live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of the program. If you want to join us, feel free. Our phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. And the House Ethics Committee is thinking of expelling George Santos after a release of this report that they came out with today. And man, uh, it seems somewhat damning. Uh, I've invited Congressman, Congressman Santos on the show several times. Uh, he's been on the show before. And uh, when I was a local host in New York, uh, he'd come on the show as well. Uh, I think he's a pretty nice guy uh, outside of, you know, whatever accusations are here. Very nice guy. I actually bumped into him at a funeral a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, and uh, and, and at a, a different party. And uh, very nice guy. Um, it, it's it's a shame that, you know, this actually, uh, that he made these choices and whatever and whatnot and how it's going down. Because uh, I don't know that we'll retain this seat in Congress um, now that he's announced he's not running for re-election. Uh, but we do have a couple of clips of audio on how this stuff transpired today, and I want you to hear it. Uh, let's start with, let's see here, number 21, uh, Congressman Nick Langworthy, former um, chair of the New York Republican Party. Listen to this. 23 uh, felonies. He's, he's uh, our counts in it. Uh, and that charge at this point, uh, and, and the facts just aren't on his side. And, and I, I just don't see any situation where he's going to evade, ultimately, prosecution and conviction. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Nick Langworthy wasn't done there. He had a couple more things to say. It'll be very hard for people to, to say, yes, this individual should stay here in the ranks and, and make the you know, critical decisions uh, that are before us. So now the chairman of the House Ethics Committee uh, is going to move to expel uh, Congressman Santos from Congress after the release of the report. And uh, Chairman Guest feels, here's a quote, Chairman Guest feels that the evidence uncovered in the committee's investigation is more than sufficient to warrant punishment and that the most appropriate punishment is expulsion. That's um, uh, Mississippi, excuse me, Mississippi Congressman Michael Guest's office um, reporting to Fox News. So George Santos continuously under fire. It's it's a shame. Uh, like I said, he's 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 a, he's a nice guy. He really is. He's not a terrible guy. But looks like he's done some terrible things, and that's uh, lamentable. Uh, now, Congressman Pat Ryan also um, had something to say. Check this out. If you're elected on a blatant foundation of lies, it's a disservice to not just your constituents, but to our democracy. So he is such an exceptional case that it merits an exceptional remedy. Now, listen, um, not a special pleader for Congressman Santos, but for anybody, you know, even Gold Bar Bob. If they said they were going to expel Gold Bar Bob, uh, Senator Bob Menendez from Congress, I would say if I were him, I'd say, hold on a second. You can expel me all you want once I've been convicted. But just based on this notion that, um, you know, you guys found this and found that, I, I would push back if it were me. Because you never know. It's Washington. People get railroaded all the time. Right? But uh, this seems the direction that they want to go in. Representative Robert Garcia from California uh, has uh, announced that, yes, uh, in fact, the efforts are in motion to expel him from Congress. Listen to this. Uh, we filed uh, in the House floor uh, an expulsion of uh, George Santos, of Congressman Santos. Um, it's really important for us to recognize that George Santos is uh, a fraud, a liar. He has lied about the most horrific shooting in, the, in LGBTQ modern history, the Pulse nightclub shooting. He's lied about 9-11. He's lied about the Holocaust. He's lied about his education. He's lied about his career. Uh, and as we all know, just recently, he's been now given classified access to important information and classified information that he should not have. 
Uh, there's been numerous Republicans that have called for his uh, expul expulsion or res resignation from Congress. Now, listen, lots of Congress people lie. Lots of politicians lie. And I would love to see so many of these lying politicians get, getting the same, the same treatment here, right? Um, I mean, you had Joe Biden. Joe Biden sat there and he gave this beautiful soliloquy. I wish we had the audio to play for you. But, uh, you know, he says uh, some reporter questioned him on something and he came back with this beautiful retort that was, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I got three degrees. I got four of this. I got this. That. I graduated in the top five percent of my class. Blah, 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 blah. And, and every last thing he said was a lie. I mean, this is the same guy that was um, forced to drop out of a presidential race a million years ago when it was found that he was plagiarizing his speeches. Yet this guy's sitting in the White House today with more plastic surgery than Nancy Pelosi. How does that work? He's never gotten expelled from anything. Uh, so I, I got to tell you, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, people want to make Santos out to be the bad guy. I understand he lied and defrauded. And listen, everybody's got to be accountable. Everybody pays the piper. However, it just seems like he's an easy target, right? To me, it seems like go after somebody, you know, how about the guy that pulled the fire alarm, pulled a fire alarm during the, uh, the, the counting of the votes for the, for the um, debt ceiling bill. That's right. Congressman Jamal Bowman from New York, a colleague of George Santos on the Democrat side. Why don't we criminally prosecute him, right? There was no prosecution, criminal prosecution. Uh, he got in trouble. He got arrested and he turned himself in. He said, oh, I thought it was a door. A door that said, in case of fire, pull here, right? I mean, just you, you just can't make it up. And then the video showed that there, it, it was even worse than that. Uh, all I could say is politicians lie like crazy. And to, to zone in and hone in on George Santos, who is probably going to make a ton of money when he sells the rights to this as a book or a movie. Uh, because, you know, honestly, if, if it's all true, what a remarkable movie that'll be. You know, I mean, again, if it's all true, I, I don't know what's true, and what's not true. But I, I do know they said he was a drag queen in Brazil, came to the United States, lied his way into this, that, the other, defrauded people out of money for their pets, money for this, money for that, pretended to be an investor, got his way into Congress, won, lost, ran again, won again. <laughs> I mean, all I could say is, man, it is it is quite a tale uh, and quite a quite an achievement. And, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that he shouldn't get in trouble. I'm just saying, of all people in the world, George Santos, come on, you know, uh, expulsion. You've got Rashida Tlaib, who is the, the uh, chairman of the Hamas caucus in Congress, and she's not getting expelled. Ilhan Omar, who said some people did something. Yep, she's not getting expelled. Nobody seems to be getting expelled except the Republican. And it seems to be his colleagues that are out to get him. And I guess, look, there's a degree of that that's important because you got to say, look, we're serious people. We take our job seriously. We take our caucus seriously. And we're not going to allow those types of shenanigans. And I get that. I just say, keep dishing it out. Don't just stop with Santos. I mean, this is a softball here. You got to go after the people that are, you know, repeat offenders. This is his first term in Congress. What about all these people that lie and lie and lie and get reelected each and every time? These are the people that I think we've got to, you know, put our focus on. But anyway, we're going to get into what's going on in Congress, the uh, congressional um, bills that are coming forward, that are forthcoming um, and uh, on crime and other things. And uh, I also want to get an update on the continuing resolution that was passed in both the House and the Senate, what we can expect. Do we ever get a budget? We're going to have that discussion and more straight ahead. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back. Amigos, we continue our conversation on the CR that was passed yesterday. 
Uh, some people questioned whether the Senate would pass it. They did. And now the question remains, what can we look forward to? And there's a lot of debate on whether uh, the current speaker is doing the right thing. He's doing the wrong thing. Uh, you know, my opinion is I believe he's doing what he has to do. Being speaker is not an easy gig and being in government's not an easy gig. And it's easy to be in talk radio that I can tell you. Um, easy compared to being in Congress because I don't have to vote on anything. I could speak my mind on everything and it's all ideology for me. I don't have to worry about what the Democrats are doing. I don't have to get along with them. They're not my colleagues. But when you're in Congress, there's a lot of moving parts and I get what Speaker Johnson's doing. You got to give him the benefit of the doubt to hope and trust and expect that we will eventually pass a budget. But I want to get into that conversation with Congressman Mike Lawler from New York, uh, 17th district. He's with us. He serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Financial Services Committee. Congressman Lawler, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Rich. You bet, brother. So let's let's uh, let's get into this. The a uh, lot of people were critical, or some people, I should say, were critical of the CR, saying we should never have a CR. And uh, you know, I would probably be one of those people if I'd never worked in government. I worked in government in the state of New Jersey, and I realized no matter what was on my conservative wish list. I didn't always get to get it right because you had to work with a ton of Democrats. And I understand how that works. But um, there, there's a fight for principle. And I think there's 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 a base that wants that red meat. And I think all Americans want to see a budget passed eventually. What what is your thought on a on this on this CR? Um, you know, some people were critical of what wasn't in it. What was in it? Uh, what say you? Well, I think, you know, some people who say they want to shut down want it until it impacts them. And, uh, you know, when you when you look at the consequences of a shutdown or, you know, earlier this year, had we defaulted on our debt, uh, there would be real impacts on our economy. Uh, and, you know, that obviously will not benefit or help anyone. Uh, and in fact, it's not going to save us money to shut the government down. It's going to cost us money. So the reality for us, you're referring here, to like back pay and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and interest payments. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you see, uh, you know, if Moody's or S&P start to downgrade us even further because of a shutdown or because of uh, a default, that has a tremendous impact on the interest payments on our debt. So we have real challenges. We're facing $34 trillion in debt. The Biden administration in its first two years uh, increased spending by over $5 trillion in new spending. It's totally unsustainable. And voters elected a House re Republican majority mm -hmm. to serve as a check and balance on this administration and to rein in spending. And we have been going through that process methodically uh, over the course of the year. Uh, but it takes time. Uh, this is a process that has been broken for 30 years, uh, where Democrats and Republicans passed one omnibus spending bill after the next, mm -hmm. pass continuing resolution at one after the next. Um, and this and this system has been broken. We are going through the, the appropriations bills, single subject, line by line, uh, and finding savings. Now, part of the challenge that we've had uh, this year within the conference has been uh, a disagreement about the number. Uh, many of my uh, colleagues uh, feel that the uh, limit save grow number that we passed uh, should be the, the guiding uh, number here. Uh, and many of us feel that, you know, yes, we would have liked to, to have more reductions, but we came to an agreement in the Fiscal Responsibility Act with the administration and the Senate on a top line number, uh, you know, 1.592 uh, trillion. And so if we're, if we're going to get through the appropriations process in the House, uh, part of the challenge has been, you know, this back and forth internally. Uh, and it's part of the fight that surrounded the removal of, of Speaker McCarthy. Uh, and now Speaker Johnson is dealing uh, with, this, with the same challenge, frankly. And the continuing resolution uh, is simply keeping the lights on while we work through the appropriations process. If sure. we shut down the government, especially after the, the month-long speaker fiasco, uh, it, it would be cataclysmic, and both politically and governmentally. And it doesn't benefit us to shut the government down while we're trying to work through the appropriations process, especially in a divided government where Democrats control the Senate and the White House. 
Joe Biden would do exactly what Barack Obama did when there was a government shutdown uh, back in 2013. He would make it as painful as possible. He would shut down every national park. He would fence things up. He would put people, you know, on furloughs. And it would be it would be extremely and blame painful. You. And he would blame the Republicans. And the media would blame the Republicans. And, uh, you know, the Senate would blame the Republicans. And so ultimately the public would blame the Republicans for it. So it, <laughs> it, that's not a winning situation. Um, what we absolutely have the ability to do is pass our single subject spending bills uh, and then go negotiate with the Senate uh, and and negotiate on important issues like the border uh, to, to actually deal with that crisis uh, and hold Schumer and the Senate Democrats accountable. Now, I get that. And, and, I, and uh, I in my heart of hearts, I agree with you because I feel that you have Democrats in the Senate. And because the Democrats are in the Senate, they can they can destroy whatever you send over there and, and it'll never happen. So you got to send them something that that's workable. Um, at the same time, I know that there's a, a real desire to, to get to a, a real budget one day. Um, is it pie in the sky thinking that that's the next step that will actually have a budget eventually that gets passed? Or is that too much to ask at this point? No, I, I think that's exactly what Speaker Johnson wants to do. We we want to finish our single subject spending bills, uh, you know, this year, uh, conference them with the Senate uh, and get them passed and signed into law and beginning of next year, uh, really lay out a, a budget. The challenge that we have as as a Republican majority is that we have a very narrow majority uh, right now, 221 members. And uh, after today's ethics. Uh, you know, report coming out on George Santos, we're likely to be down to 220 uh, before the end of the month. Uh, but, you know, when you look at this dynamic, uh, you need 218 votes, 217 votes at a given time on the floor to pass anything. And we have members that, you know, frankly, uh, at times have refused to cooperate. If they don't get their way, they stomp their feet and, and you know, basically try to shut the place down. And, it makes it very difficult to pass what we want to be able to pass. And while I, I certainly appreciate uh, my colleagues on the right pushing uh, hard to, to cut as much spending as possible, we have to deal with the reality that the Democrats control the Senate and the White House. And if you can't deal with that reality, it makes it very, very difficult to even compromise within the conference. And that is something that's been very frustrating throughout the course of the year. We're on with uh, Congressman Mike Lawler from New York's 17th Congressional District. He's on the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Financial Services Committee. Straight ahead, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Israel, his thoughts on that, as well as a couple of other things. There was an interesting day in Congress yesterday, a lot of information coming out, uh, some of your colleagues um, calling out Christopher Ray on a, a number of issues, and uh, we'll try and get some re- reaction on that as well. And I want to invite you guys to call if you have a question. Feel free, 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. If you're uh, listening on richvaldezamericatnight.com, you can catch any part of the program on the replay later on if you missed any of the interviews. So stick around. We're coming right back. Congressman Mike Lawler from New York. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. detail. I, I know, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to stop. The, uh, but I am, I am mildly hopeful. Of course, that's President Joe Biden, who I like to call Joe El Baboso Biden. Yesterday at his uh, big China summit in California yesterday, uh, discussing that prospect or the, uh, the, the agreement that Netanyahu's agreed to a pause. And 
uh, even even the fake news media jumped in on this, uh, saying that Blinken shook his head no <laughs> when Biden started talking about how Israel might be considering a pause. Listen to this. When President Biden was asked about the ongoing hostage negotiations, uh, he said that he was mildly hopeful. Uh, he uh, started to talk about a, a pause that Israel may have agreed to. Uh, and then he looked over at Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was sitting right in front of him, and made some remark about how perhaps he shouldn't get too much into the detail. And Secretary Blinken shaking his head, uh, shaking his, his head no, definitely do not get into too much of the detail. So, Congressman uh, Lawler, we have we have uh, Blinken, who in recent weeks, this is not the first time he's been shaking his head and like, you know, kind of lunging towards Biden to stop him from saying things. Uh, what's the story here? You're on the Foreign um, uh, Affairs Committee. What is uh, is Israel agreeing to a ceasefire to a pause? And what is Biden talking about? So I uh, over the weekend visited Israel as part of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, with Chairman McCall and uh, a number of other uh, members on a bipartisan uh, delegation. And we met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Defense uh, Minister Gallant, and U.S. Ambassador Jack Lew, as well as families of uh, the hostages. And obviously, uh, as part of the conversation, we talked about the hostages and uh, the negotiations between the United States, the Qatari uh, government, and Israel. Uh, in dealing uh, with Hamas and, and trying to uh, obviously uh, get as many of the hostages uh, home as possible, including nine Americans. And, you know, certainly uh, I think the prime minister and the Israeli government uh, are willing to engage in a, a temporary pause uh, as, as part of uh, getting the hostages out. Uh, but You know, after visiting with uh, the prime minister, after uh, meeting with the families of the hostages, and after viewing a uh, 21-minute video, uh, raw footage of the terrorist attack on October 7th, I don't know how anyone can entertain a ceasefire. Uh, Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization. Uh, They uh, are not someone that you can uh, trust nor negotiate with. Uh, over the last 15 years, there's been eight ceasefires, each time broken by Hamas. And uh, this uh, most recent attack was the greatest slaughtering of Jews since the Holocaust. And if you watch this this video, you see the, the glee with which uh, these barbaric terrorists uh, slaughter women, children, and babies uh, simply because they're Jewish. And, uh, you know, I... On our way to Israel, we stopped in London, and we went and toured Churchill's war room. And really, you know, thinking about the lead-up to World War II and the Holocaust, it very much reminded me, uh, in this moment, we cannot be a bunch of Neville Chamberlains. We have to be Winston Churchill, and victory at all costs. And I think uh, anyone demanding Israel... All right. While we work, it uh, looks like the deep state got to Congressman Lawyer, uh, Lawler. They don't like it when you, you say that Israel has to uh, to win this thing. So we'll work on getting him back. But Gail King, she was on CBS this morning and she was uh, speaking to the father of an Israeli hostage, saying that innocent Palestinians are dying, too. Listen to this. But now this seems to be all about politics. What do you say about that? You know, you have innocent children and Palestinians who are dying, innocent Israeli children who are dying. And no one seems to be able to say enough, stop that. (sighs) I'm not interested in politics at all. Uh, My only concern is getting Emily back. You know, and and I I understand this father's plight because he wants to get his kid back. And it's interesting how the media has created this scenario where it's like, all right, look, if, if the Hamas terrorists uh, killed a bunch of Israelis, Israel has the right to go and kill the Hamas terrorists, but you can't kill anybody else. And while I understand that, that uh, conventional wisdom says, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The reality is war is ugly and messy and deadly. And when you have Jordan not allowing uh, the, 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 the Gazans 
to to leave when you have Egypt not allowing uh, people, the Palestinians in Gaza, to leave. You you only are left with these safe zones that the IDF is creating, saying go here while we bomb there. But when you have Hamas terrorists that are uh, hiding in hospitals, hiding in tunnels under hospitals, and using uh, these people in effect as human shields, there's going to be collateral damage. And I don't think anybody wants to see innocent people slaughtered, uh, in, especially the Israelis, because they're the ones that lost the most innocent people. And I think we've got Congressman Lawler back. And, uh, Congressman, we left off with y- you saying that we have to have victory at all costs uh, in a Churchillian way. And with respect to the point I just made, uh, what are your thoughts? Is this a concoction of the media or is this a legitimate argument that we're going to have this beautiful, tidy, clean war where, you know, Hamas is going to be in one area and Israel can go and just bomb them free and clear of any civilians? Well, and I apologize for getting uh, cut off, but w- the point I was making is you can't have a ceasefire here. Um, you know, this is a war of good versus evil. Hamas is using its own civilians as human shields. Uh, and this is a very unique war in so far as it is in an urban center. Hamas has set up operations in hospitals, in schools, in tunnels underground. Um, you know, we're not sure exactly where the hostages are. Uh, so it complicates uh, the, the operations of this war. And, you know, Israel has a right to defend itself, and Hamas has proven itself incapable of abiding by a ceasefire, incapable of uh, negotiating, uh, their sole mission is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And Israel uh, you know, must be able uh, to eliminate Hamas. They do not want to occupy Gaza. They do not want to uh, harm the Palestinian people. They do not want uh, civilian casualties. And they are taking great caution to try and prevent that. Uh, But Hamas is using these civilians as a human shield uh, to try and protect themselves uh, after committing uh, the atrocities that they committed. And and this this type of uh, I'm going to call it guerrilla warfare, but it's really it's it's guerrilla terrorism, if you will. Um, I think the light needs to continuously be shined on that, because as long as they do that, they, they seem to be winning some part of the information war whether it's through propaganda or through the propaganda from the left within the media, where, you know, I'm in a car ride today. I had to go to a wake and I'm in the car with my uh, my children and we're, you know, going back and forth. And they're like, but they shouldn't kill the Palestinian babies just because they killed the Israeli babies. And I said, I, I agree with that statement. But when you have the Hamas terrorists hiding behind these kids and hiding in hospitals where there are children, What other outcome can there be? And I don't want to seem crass or like I'm uh, undervaluing the life of any Palestinian or any Israeli. But it is it's my contention that the media is creating an impossible, unwinnable scenario in the minds of many Americans. Do you think that's a fair statement? A thousand percent. I think uh, Israel is being held to a standard uh, that no other nation uh, is held to, including the United States. Like I said before, after 9-11, nobody would call on the United States to engage in a ceasefire with Uh, al-Qaeda. When we were going after ISIS, nobody was calling us to engage in a ceasefire. Hamas is a terrorist organization backed and funded by Iran, and uh, they need to be eliminated. And so, you know, Israel is doing everything they can to provide humanitarian relief, to provide safe passage for Palestinians from the north to the south. But you have Hamas uh, using sniper uh, fire to to kill Palestinians as they're trying to uh, leave from the north to the south. Uh, So, you know, they they do not care about their own people. They do not care uh, about innocent Palestinian civilians. Uh, They're putting them in harm's way. Um, And and that obviously complicates the the prosecution of this war. Uh, But. To, for, for folks to hold Israel to a standard that nobody else would be held to, I think is outrageous. Yeah, it seems like Hamas is um, truly the one waging the genocide here, not only on the Israelis, but on their own people in Palestine. 
And uh, it's it's a real shame. Congressman, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. I, I realize that uh, the deep state is out to get you and your cell phone, but I appreciate you making it back on. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate All right. It. Godspeed to you, sir. Folks, there is more to come straight ahead. Uh, we'll continue our discussions on this. Uh, plus, the conversation I mentioned last night, I didn't get to that audio with uh, Representative Clay Higgins uh, talking about ghost buses with uh, FBI Director Ray. I alluded to it, but I never played you the audio, so we'll do that coming up straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Welcome back. So yesterday there was a committee hearing and uh, Congressman Clay Higgins was um, questioning FBI Director Ray over. And you've probably seen this clip on the news or at least a portion of the clip. I, I've got, uh, I think, a full portion of the clip with all the context that makes all the sense in the world. But uh, Clay Higgins, just to give you that background, and I think I mentioned it last night, but without giving you the audio because we were just tight on time. But in the last hearing, uh, he, he asked them. Point blank was the FBI involved uh, where there are FBI people dressed as Trump supporters. And Ray, of course, famously said, ah, I can't I can't speak to that. I can't. I don't know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. You know, he dodged a question. So Higgins now comes with evidence, video evidence of these uh, Trump supporter dressed FBI affiliated people on a bus. At least that's what he's claiming. And again, typically, if you're a member of Congress and you have all of the uh, investigatory apparatus that they have and resources um, in the committee, it's it's doubtful to me that you're going to make a a comment like that without knowing the answer to it, right? But um, listen to this exchange between Congressman Clay Higgins and uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray. You confirmed that the FBI had confidential human sources at the Stop the Steal rally on January 6th here in D.C., sir? Thank you. Congressman, as we've discussed before, I'm not going to get into where we have or have not used confidential human sources. But what okay, I can we'll tell move you, on. you asked for a definitive answer. We'll move answer. on. It's my time. You said no. You're not going to answer. That's cool. We're watching. Mr. Chairman, may you're, I answer you're, the question? Your moment, your moment will come. This is my time. Earlier this year, an FBI informant who is reported to have, quote, his quote, under oath, marched to the U.S. Capitol with fellow Proud Boys members on January 6th, close quote. He said he was communicating with his FBI handler while people were entering the U.S. Capitol. Can you confirm that the FBI had that sort of engagement with your own agents embedded within to the crowd on January 6th? If you are asking whether the violence at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources and or agents, the answer is emphatically You're saying not. no? No. You're saying no? Not okay. violence orchestrated Let's by FBI on. sources or agents. Are you familiar with, with, you know what a ghost vehicle is? Director, director of the FBI certainly should. You know what a ghost bus is? A ghost bus? Ghost bus. I'm not sure I've used that term before. Okay. Now, if I were the FBI director, I would have used humor to my advantage and said, is a ghost bus where the ghostbusters travel? And, you know, try to get a laugh out of him. I don't think he was going to get a laugh at Clay Higgins. Uh, he, he was like a dog with a bone, and he knew exactly what he wanted to get out of Ray, and Ray was, again, squirming. I don't know what a ghost bus is. Uh, so, you know, it, it brings up the point now. When you're asking uh, Director Ray and you say, hey, do you know what a ghost bus is? Uh, I'm guessing, again, my speculation is that he already knows the answer to this. Uh, but Ray says, uh, I, I don't know what a ghost bus is. I, I don't use that terminology. Maybe he calls them informant buses, right? <laughs> informant vehicles, Wh whatever it is. You know, they have all sorts of names, confidential human source, blah, blah, blah. 
And my supposition here is that Ray has a different terminology for this, um, wants to operate as if he doesn't know what's going on. And listen, there may in fact be the possibility <clears throat> that Ray was kept completely in the dark, as is so often the way government operations work, where underlings will go ahead and orchestrate a plan, pull the trigger on the plan, and execute that plan. And with the hope that the, the higher up, in this case, Director Ray, could always have plausible deniability. You know, kind of like, I didn't know what they were doing. You know, they did that on their own. Well, shoot, I had no idea. I, to, to the best of my recollection, I, I can't recall. And, and this is the game that they play. But it's clear as day to me that the evidence is there, the videos are there, the testimony's there, sworn testimony under oath, that an FBI source was communicating with an FBI handler as people were entering the Capitol building on January 6th. To suggest that the, the people that were at the Stop the Steal rally, many of them elderly, uh, again, this was a, a rally that happened in the middle of the day. So, yeah, there were people there that were, you know, wanted to be there, no doubt. But a lot of people were retirees, people that were able to take off during the week. And many of the people arrested were, were of age. So uh, this stuff just doesn't add up to me. Smells very, very fishy. And I don't trust Christopher Ray. More after this. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, to the phones we go. I want to know what are your thoughts on the ghost buses? With uh, this testimony from Christopher Ray, is he a fake phony fraud or what? Let's go to Kim. She's in Michigan on KDKA. Go right ahead. Hi, Rich. Thank hey. you. I called about something else, but I would like to comment on the ghost buses. Um, I said this a long time ago, right after it happened, because all the Trump supporters were a mile away, like hundreds of thousands of them were a mile away. President Trump got there late, so his speech didn't even start for like an hour, hour and a half later. Meanwhile, all these buses showed up right on time in in front of the uh, Capitol there, and I said, who are all these people? That was the Antifa. This is what I'm saying. This was the Antifa. This was the Black Lives Matter. This was the, um, un, the FBI informants. This, this was all the bad guys that got unloaded off those buses right in front of the Capitol. Could I say something else, too? Uh, yeah, quickly. Okay. Um, the Palestinians are going to be a problem even when this is over. When Israel has, like, obliterated the Gaza Strip and they've obliterated all the tunnels, what are they going to do with the Gaza people? They need to find a real—they shouldn't have to be Israel's problem anymore. They should find—like, I'm thinking someplace like Antarctica, but where there's no <laughs> other people in it. But they have to seriously put them somewhere where they can't do damage or they'll elect Hamas to rule them again, to be their government, and it'll start all over again. Where, and well, it's, it's a possibility, them. but here's the thing, Kim. I think, you know, in, in all of the wars that we've been a part of, um, we eventually squash those beefs, right? You know, the, the, the Japanese don't hate us today, despite what we did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I, I think there's hope. I also think when people, you know, there's going to be people that say, oh, my gosh, the Israelis killed us. We'll hate them forever. They're our sworn enemies. But there's going to be other people that say, you know what? Hamas did some stupid stuff, got us all killed, and we're not messing with that anymore. We can only hope that common sense rules. Folks, Rich Valdez coming right back. the city that never sleeps. 
17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of the program, hour number two. And, of course, uh, we're still continuing our coverage and analysis of what happened yesterday in uh, the big uh, summit, the President Xi Summit, as many are calling it. And there's a couple of clips of audio that came from that meeting. And... Uh, one of them was where Biden calls she a dictator. Listen to this. And Mr. President, after today, would you still refer to President Xi as a dictator? This is a term uh, that you used earlier this year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a form of government totally different than ours. <laughs> How's that for an answer? <laughs> and it's uh, almost sounded like Kam- Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris was his um, speechwriter for that one. Yeah, well, he's a dictator. He runs this communist country. Um, and, of course, John Kirby had to go on television and uh, clean that up today on MSNBC on The Morning Joke. He says that, well, she actually delivered results for Americans. Listen to this. This meeting yesterday actually delivered results for the American people and, quite frankly, the people of China and people around the world. But the American people benefited from this sit down together between President Xi and President Biden. First is on fentanyl. And the Chinese, for the first time now in several years, have agreed to cooperate with us in a law enforcement manner to get after the chemical ingredients of fentanyl and stop them from being exported from China to Latin America. That will have a significant impact on the production of fentanyl uh, and the flow into the United States. And then number two, and you mentioned it, it's the military to military communications. And I know people could maybe pass that off and, well, what's the big deal about getting, you know, generals and admirals on the phone with one another? It's a huge development, a big step forward here because we haven't been able to do that. I don't know. That seemed to me, I'm scared. (laughs) What do I want our generals on the phone with China for when we may have to um, one day have conflict with them? It's like, would you think it's a good idea if um, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and their generals, if General Soleimani was on the phone with uh, with General C.Q. Brown, would that make anybody feel better? It wouldn't make me feel better. I don't think that's a good idea. But again, maybe that's commonplace in today's diplomacy, and I'm just um, naive to it. But I want to get with an expert here because this sounds very fishy to me. And Michael Pillsbury is a senior fellow for China strategy at the Heritage Foundation. He's also the author of the book, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. Michael Pillsbury, welcome back, sir. Thank you, Rich. My pleasure. Let's um, let's get into this audio we just played. Um, do you think that John Kirby is full of it when he says this was really good for Americans, this meeting? And moreover, what would you make of Biden saying that she is a dictator? I think it was accurate. I just thought his delivery was funny. Well, the reporter was saying that you six months ago or some earlier occasion, you called him a dictator. Do you still think that? So that would have been Biden's chance to say, well, you know, he's a nicer guy than I thought or put some kind of positive spin on it. But instead, Biden just kind of. And like a robot, he just repeated what he had said six months earlier. And then the Chinese got after him. The the, the Chinese have their own agenda for this summit. And they got most of what they wanted. But what they wanted in part was a a sense of legitimacy and even praise from Biden. And you you may recall they they gave a clip of the opening where Biden said he was an honor to to welcome Xi Jinping as his guest. So... The the Chinese goal overall was a combination of getting American foreign investment, American investment in high technology especially, to return to China because it's been uh, sort of scared off the last few years. And I think they succeeded in doing that. You saw the standing ovation the CEOs gave him, gave Xi Jinping. And they also wanted to get a sense of uh, 
legitimacy that we are the number two power in the world and look how the Americans treat us with great respect and uh, deference. Yeah, so they got that. Whether, whether, <laughs> yes, whether we got what we wanted is another story. I disagree with Admiral Kirby. The, um, the fentanyl language that they agreed to is just to cooperate or to study the problem. It doesn't set up a specific law enforcement activity that starts right now. And when Kirby referred to several years ago, what he means is uh, President Trump got a written deal that the Chinese did implement. They would put fentanyl on the controlled substance list over in China and treat it as a, as a drug that has to be uh, monitored by law enforcement. So it's not clear to me that on the fentanyl agreement, they made any further progress than what Trump achieved. Um, on the military contacts, it's the same thing. There's a sort of an understanding that they will now restart, but they didn't actually restart the contacts. And the important thing about that is in case of an accident or uh, one jet fighter runs into another, uh, you know, they came as close as 10 feet to one of our B-52 bombers just a right. couple of weeks ago. If something like that happens, the idea of getting on the phone is to say, are you starting a war or is this <laughs> just an accident, in which case we forgive you? So, <laughs> but that, but that too is not a signed agreement. Um, the same thing with their environmental deal that was announced a couple of days earlier on Tuesday in San Francisco, that John Kerry and the Chinese environmental guy, uh, Mr. Xia, they reached kind of a vague cooperative agreement, uh, but it did not have anything serious like banning coal-fired plants that China's building one new, one new one every week. So it but one of the strangest things about the whole summit is there was talk in advance there was going to be a joint statement, and both sides were working hard on the language of the joint statement involving Ukraine, uh, perhaps Hamas and Israel, just a long list of things that they would agree to. There was no joint statement. That's extremely important. It means they could not reach agreement on it. Instead, they have this sort of uh, Admiral Kirby casual announcement uh, on MSNBC that this is all good for the American people, but no details and nothing in writing. Yeah, I mean, this to me, it, it seems like a, a publicity stunt. It doesn't seem like it was a real summit, a real meeting of the minds. And, and there was no accord that came out of it. No, no uh, real deal. And uh, the idea that she says, I don't want to see any more Americans die from fentanyl. Um, obviously, right. I mean, <laughs> if he were saying the opposite, it would be a. Uh, it would be uh, alarming. Like, I want to see more. I, I think it's a supposition that we have. Now, of course, the supposition that I have is that China is happy to see Americans die at the hands of fentanyl uh, because they don't like us. Do you think I'm wrong in that thought? Well, the details that have come out over the past several years is that some Chinese, Xi Jinping says they're criminals, but some Chinese are helping money laundering of the Mexican drug cartels. They're helping with precursor chem, uh, chemicals. They're helping with these uh, pill devices. So Xi Jinping says these are criminals, but he can obviously arrest them, find out who they are, <laughs> right. hand them over to us. You know, it's within his power in the, in the great surveillance state that China is, and they're proud of it. Uh, he can't crack down on the people doing this. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe. But if it's with the overall summit that China got what it wanted, um, an increase in investment, and also the legitimacy came from all those CEOs paying $40,000 a head to come to the dinner. Um, Apple, for example, Google, they're all there, and they want to increase their business and technology sales to China. So it's a success from the Chinese point of view, but I'm not quite sure what we got out of it. Other than it's supposed to show that uh, Joe Biden is a great statesman, and in this case, he's we hope he's avoided a war over Taiwan. But they haven't; they've released nothing about that. I noticed in Emil Kirby uh, in his TV presentation, also in President Biden's version of, of events, notice there's no mention of Taiwan, and that has been the real problem. That there have been 10 to 20 jet fighters or bombers and naval ships every day going around Taiwan in a kind of military intimidation campaign. 
<clears throat> prior to their elections coming up on January 13th. No mention of that. Did China promise to stop or cut back the military intimidation bomber flights? Uh, I would guess not. Otherwise, they would have uh, bragged about it. So we'll know in a few days. Taiwan uh, announces every night the Taiwan Defense Ministry puts out the number of jet fighters, bombers, and ships that have challenged their airspace. You know, uh, Michael Pillsbury, I um, saw my nephew today, and he's lived in Taiwan for the last, I'd say, four or five years, just moved to uh, Manchester in England. Uh, and I was yes. asking him, I said, you know, what, what are your thoughts on on this invasion? A lot of people think. And he said, oh, it'll never happen. Now, he's a very apolitical guy, young guy. Uh, but he said, oh, it'll never happen. There's too much investment in Taiwan. And uh, nobody wants to see that go anywhere. So it, it's all posturing from China. Um, I told him I, don't, I wouldn't sell that uh, that just yet. Right. I, I think that's a, a premature judgment. But what's your thought? Do you think uh, Taiwan's imminently uh, under threat from China? Well, over the last 40 years, we've had a policy to not have American troops on the island. We don't train with the Taiwan military. We don't have the old defense treaty where we had a kind of uh, annual exercise to test who would do what in the event of a Chinese attack. All that's gone away. And the optimists, I guess like your nephew, would say, uh, well, it's the policy has worked. China hasn't invaded the only thing is that Taiwan and to some degree the United States were beginning to break the rules of what this policy was. <clears throat> we put some spe- a few special forces troops were placed there uh, in secret by President Trump, and then the Biden people leaked it to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so there's been a series of provocations now, and there's, as I said, there's this election January 20th. Also in our, our Congress, both the House and Senate are considering additional uh, closeness and military ties with Taiwan. So this all, the Chinese say, provokes them. Now, <clears throat> maybe they'll say, yes, you know, we've got 2 million Taiwanese in the mainland who are businessmen. We've got massive trade back and forth. We've got massive investment back and forth. Taiwan has actually helped China with its economic growth over the last 30 years, introducing them around the world to penetrate supply chains that China could not have done without Taiwan's help. So it's right to think of them as being closer than the Cold War. This is not like Berlin. Um, But on the other hand, the Chinese have done this military buildup over the last 10 years. And now over the past year, they've started this really serious intimidation campaign. So it's hard to be complacent and say, oh, gee, nothing can happen. Although I noticed you mentioned General C.Q. Brown. He made a speech in Tokyo saying he does not think there'll be a Chinese invasion. He thinks they'll use other means. And obviously the first choice would not be an invasion. The first choice would be political uh, surrender by Taiwan. And that's what's at stake in these elections, January 13th. Right. And uh, we know with their idea of uh, unrestricted warfare, they'd like to do everything but go to war, and they're, they're pretty good at it. Folks, we're on with Michael Pillsbury from the Heritage Foundation, and he's got an excellent piece on winning the new Cold War, a plan for countering China. I want to get into that a little bit straight ahead. Folks, if you want to call us, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Familia, welcome back. Amigos, we are on with Michael Pillsbury, 
Uh, he is with the Heritage Foundation, where he is the senior fellow on their China strategy, and he's also the uh, author of The 100-Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. And he's written a a piece uh, over the spring, Winning the New Cold War, A Plan for Countering China. Uh, Michael Pillsbury, in the few minutes we have remaining, I'd love for you to walk us through a little bit about this. Well, the Heritage Report is a team effort. Uh, it involves a lot of other think tanks being consulted in Washington, D.C., and it's based on two ideas. One is that we're already in a Cold War with China, that the Chinese, uh, as I outlined in 100-Year Marathon, I should do a plug, which for 100-Year Marathon, it's down to only $12. <laughs> it's oh, only nice. $12 for the paperback. Now's edition. the time to get it. I always recommend <laughs> buy two copies. If you're going to get one, get two and give one away as a gift because it's Christmas is coming. I was just going to say it makes a fine Christmas present, although it's a little bit alarming. Uh, but that that's the idea of a Cold War with China uh, having already commenced. That's the foundation of this new heritage plan. And what the team did is actually examine about 100 ideas that the U.S. Congress has already considered. Somebody would, let's say – uh, don't sell farmland to China that's near an American military base. That's been proposed by a number of members of the House and Senate, uh, Joni Ernst on the Senate side, for example. But it's never gotten any co-sponsors, never been considered. Uh, <laughs> it's, not, right. it's not happening. Same thing with the other 99 examples we give. Um, so what Heritage Foundation is trying to do, we have a, something called Heritage Action as well. We're, starting, we're going to start keeping track of who is blocking this legislation um, and why doesn't anything happen? Why is everything paralyzed? So right. what we do is we have, we have one page for each of the ideas and then who would do it, what, what it would take in terms of congressional action. And we've been quite surprised that even uh, something as simple – everybody knows that's our investment in China that has caused them to become such a massive economic power. So we had to get control of it. What are we, what are our companies investing? So there was a proposal, all companies who invest in China, especially the high tech sectors must report their investment to the U S government in advance. Didn't pass much weakened version came out. Um, So if we don't know what we're investing if we don't know what kind of export controls we have and what results they're getting, right. if, we're not, if we're not protecting our own homeland uh, in terms of the, the, the farm property, if we're not building up our forces to match Chinese forces, that's what we're beginning to fall behind uh, in a number of areas, right. uh, including Which surprising areas like, 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 uh, like outer space forces where the Chinese have shown enough that President Trump had to form the – the Space Force and the Space Command. And you're right. So Michael that's, Pillsbury, that's what, that's let me just remind the about. audience who we're on with. Uh, we're on with Michael Pillsbury from the Heritage Foundation. And again, he's written an amazing book. You want to get it. The 100-Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. Michael Pillsbury, I want to thank you for joining us. Have a great Thanksgiving. Hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you, Rich. You bet. Have a great night. We'll be right back, America. All right, America, welcome back. We continue our discussions on what's going on in the world tonight. And I want to get to the topic of what's happening on American college campuses, because it seems like week after week, we hear story after story about new Jew hatred coming from all over the place. A couple of weeks back, we had uh, one of my old uh, broadcasting colleagues on whose nephew was at the Cooper Union debacle 
where they trapped him in the library. But that wasn't isolated. This continues to go on. And uh, Davian Geckman is with us. Uh, he's a student at Cornell University who's been targeted due to having family in Israel. Davian, welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I want to, you know, tell us your story a little bit. Um, so you're at Cornell in Ithaca? Correct. Yeah, I'm at Cornell in Ithaca. I'm a freshman here. So, you know, I'm like barely got my foot in the door. And all of a sudden, you know, the, it seems like I'm on the front lines of a battle against uh, hatred against the Jewish community. And, you know, what's interesting here is um, there was a, a clip of audio I've played several times of of a guy, I, I think he was um, from Philadelphia, and there were other college professors at this same rally. But I want you to listen to this because people, you know, have criticized me when I say a pro-Hamas rally. And they're like, come on, you're being extreme. These are people that want the innocent people in Palestine to be okay. And, and I believe many people do want that, but that doesn't mean that amongst them, by and large, especially the ones with their faces covered, are pro-Hamas. And I know it because I see the reports and I listen to the audio. Check this out. To Hamas for a job well done. When they woke up in the morning and they found and they found the field hands in the house with a knife ready to cut their throats. I was late to the news, but when I heard it, I smiled. I don't want to hear that 250. 250 innocent Israelis again. Again, I swear, I salute Hamas. A job well done. When you hear something like that, and again, this was in a public park in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know, it's not like this type of radicalism was born of uh, of uh, an activist in in Gaza. This is right here in the United States. Uh, Davian, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, Rich, like, look, this is the same thing happened here at Cornell in Ithaca Commons, right? So it wasn't even on Cornell's campus. It was the middle of Ithaca, right? The town was population 30,000. A Cornell professor came out and he said that he found that, that Hamas's attacks exhilarating. Look, as much as people really call for a ceasefire, as much as, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, Palestinian rallies are really in some ways, are really in support of the citizens of Palestine, a lot of them, like you said, are pro Hamas rallies. You know, maybe I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's majority or if it's not majority, but they get infiltrated enough that they turn from being a calm, you know, peaceful rally calling for the end of the war to all of a sudden being a pro Hamas rally. You know, they scream from the river to the sea. Uh, they yell, you know, for another intifada. They, they call for the death of the Israeli state, which in essence is calling for the death of the Jewish people. Yeah, no question. And what's interesting here is this is one of few topics um, that there's agreement between Republicans and Democrats, right? I mean, um, minority leader, or I should say the House Speaker says no ceasefire and uh, Hamas are terrorists. Um, Hakeem Jeffries says that from the river to the sea is an anti-Semitic comment that calls for the elimination of Israel and Israel's an ally of the United States. So, I mean, they, they're on the same page there. And they even uh, censured Rashida Tlaib. Uh, I can't think of yep. many issues where Congress is united. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and no, I, I'm glad that they are on this one. How is it that so many Americans are lost on this, Davian? I, I honestly can't tell you. I mean, one thing I will tell you this is that Israel has had a issue after issue with every single conflict that happens. They keep w losing the social media game. And I think it's something that, you know, Israel and just nations all across the world are analyzing of when we go to war with another nation, how do we win over public support? It's something that Ukraine was, you know, very successfully able to do, win over public support. And it's something that Israel has failed to do, even in light of the massacres. I think in some ways, really, uh, there's just a extremist group on the far right and the far left that is so blinded by their hatred against Israel that they don't, you know, they don't see the actual truth of what is going on. And in some ways, it's also a lot to do with social media, like I just said. 
if you look at a lot of these, you know, it, the reason why there's such a focus on college campuses is because there's a lot of anti-Semitism that's coming from the Gen Z community. I mean, there's polling after polling has shown that part of the Gen Z community finds what Hamas, Hamas's actions as like ju- as justified. They find the actions of terrorists justified. Just yesterday, there was uh, a TikTok trend going around of how uh, people were agreeing with bin Laden's letter to America and all of a sudden justifying that 9-11 was actually a fight against resistance and fighting against colonizers. I mean, it's just scary to see this. I mean, I'm part of this generation. You know, I, you know, a lot, of these, a lot of these generations, many of them are my friends, but it's scary to see what this new generation is really kind of coming up with and what the, you know, what they're propagating out in public. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I was looking at that last night and I promised the audience I'd be talking about it tonight. So we're going to take a quick pause and then we'll come back and discuss a little bit of how Americans are becoming radicalized uh, to become radical left wingers. And I, I find it remarkable that, you know, this is happening on TikTok. Folks, don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with uh, Cornell University student Davian Geckman, who's been targeted uh, for his family being in Israel. And we're going to hear more on that story as well. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Welcome back, amigos. We're on with Davian Geckman. He's a student at Cornell University. And tell us about how you were targeted because of simply having family in Israel. Uh, time for more context. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the grandson of uh, a Holocaust survivor. My parents are, uh, are Ukrainian immigrants. So they really left, uh, they left the sort of Ukraine to seek refuge in the United States and for them to see me really have to face the anti-Semitism that they thought that I was safe from has been a scary sight for them. I think in general, I've been targeted the same way as every other student has on Cornell's campus with, you know, dealing with rallies where people are calling for the, the genocide of, you know, Israel, where there are people calling for another intifada, where there are people, uh, you know, and we most recently, of course, we had a student who threatened to bomb the kosher center here on campus, as well as do other horrific things to Jewish people in this community. So it's been scary in the sense of just seeing my friends being afraid. Fear, I think, is something that's very contagious. And, you know, seeing my friends, seeing my classmates, seeing, you know, people who I usually go out with on Friday nights, all of a sudden not want to because they feel afraid using a buddy system to get from class to class uh right after the student came out and threatened to bomb you know uh and kill jewish students on campus a lot of students went home a lot of students didn't attend class and it's just not fair for any college students to have to go through that i agree with that 100 percent. and before the break we um you, you mentioned what was going on on tiktok and I have a clip of that so the audience can hear exactly what you're talking about. And it's a letter from the Defense Department that was um, it's on the Defense Department website. And it's fascinating that, you know, people took this letter and are now inspired by this terrorist, (laughs) Osama bin Laden. And they read the letter, you know, which starts in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful to the American people. And. You know, a guy that that killed literally thousands of Americans and and now they're beginning to sympathize with the killer, the murderer, the terrorist. Listen to this. This morning I read Letter to America, which is Osama bin Laden's letter to America explaining why he attacked Americans. And I am ashamed to say that I not only have never read this letter, 
but I didn't even know this letter existed. It's wild, and everyone should read it. If you haven't read it yet, read it. However, be forewarned that this has left me very disillusioned, and I feel the same exact way I felt when I was deconstructing Christianity. I feel uh, a little bit just confused, like I have entered into another timeline. What is this? And yeah, so go read it. So this is, um, again, uh, just a fascinating example of how people are sympathizing with the enemy. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, winning the war on social media. And this is, you know, before social media, they had to win the war in the newspapers. And propaganda is propaganda no matter where you put it. I've seen videos that claim to be IDF soldiers doing certain things that are no doubt videos created by Hamas um, to make Israeli soldiers look bad. Now, I'm sure there's video out there of IDF soldiers um, behaving inappropriately. I'm sure that exists. But there are many out there that are clearly silly. They're just silly and they're fake and they look fake, but they're designed to, to fool people. And it's just uh, it's remarkable how much in, um, misinformation, disinformation and information warfare goes into these conflicts. Why do you feel that young people are so easily drawn to falling in love with our enemies? Uh, you know, I think part of it is somewhat of this idea of, you know, teenagers wanting to rebel against society's norms. But I think part of it is also just, I mean, it, it's such a deeper problem where you go into our education system, where are they really teaching American values? You know, the question is, you know, how are these students all of a sudden, you know, finding Osama bin Laden's uh, message something uh, as inspiration? You know, are, are students being taught 9-11 in schools or is it something that, you know, on 9-11 they just kind of, uh, you know, stand a moment of silence and recognize like this is just another uh, holiday or just a grieving moment? Uh, and in terms of this, you know, the amount of people that have been in support of Hamas, again, I think it just goes to show, I think it's really goes down to the social media game where there's so many people that are coming out in support of Hamas and it's just kind of joining like the popularity, joining the ride. I think you see this with every new social justice, new, new topic. You see people just thinking, you know, this is something that I want to join in on. Like, I want to, I want to join the hype, for right. in some it's ways. Group and think. Exactly, it is very much group think. And you know, I've learned here at Cornell University, my little time here, that group think is dangerous. It can lead oh, to yeah. people really getting disillusioned, and it's led to ca catastrophic uh, events and uh, ideas coming to rise in power. I think you're right, Davian, and I, I really want to thank you for being with us. You, you br brought up some great points uh, as a college student. I wanted to get your perspective because you're there on campus and you're seeing this stuff unfold. Godspeed to you. Uh, I'm glad that thank your grandparents you. taught you about the Holocaust. I, I can tell you this. Um, you know, I'm a Puerto Rican kid uh, that was born in Brooklyn, New York, was there as a kid and then moved to Jersey. And I could tell you when I was a kid, I grew up in a, a right adjacent to a Jewish neighborhood. It was for the most part a Jewish neighborhood back then. And we had something I'd never seen any other ethnic group have, which was Hatzola and, and the, the JDL, the Jewish defense league. And it, it, I, I, it was normal for me as a kid to see um, Hasidic Jews with guns on their hips in cars that had police lights on them. And I always wondered, I was like, oh, I guess they're cops and they're Jews. <laughs> uh, you know, as I got older, I realized they're still the only group of people that have that. And I always wonder why. Why do they insist on having their own safety patrol, public safety group, private police, if you will, that's all volunteer? And, and the reason why is because the Jews have been persecuted. And after the Holocaust, they swore never again. And that's how you make sure you don't have this ever again is you stay vigilant, you stay ready, you teach your kin, you let everybody know about the history that you faced, and you make sure that whatever neighborhood you go into that you're safe because you may face this type of uh, adversity again. And and uh, my hat's off to, to the Jews that do that. It was a wonderful neighborhood that I grew up in. It was very safe. It was very clean. But 
my, my point is I've never seen the, the Koreans have to do that or any other minority group that may be under attack because the, the uh, I, I'm going to go on a limb here and say the attack was never as severe as what we saw from Hitler or even what we're seeing now in uh, by Hamas. Now, true, we did drop two atomic bombs on Japan, uh, but I've still never seen a Japanese neighborhood with their own private police. And I don't see the Japanese people saying they hate America, at least not today. So it, it to me, th- this whole thing comes full circle with understanding your plight. And uh, it's so important for you to be tapped into your history. Like you said, if they gloss over 9-11 and it's just another day and it's just another, you know, 45 seconds of silence, they're never going to really um, grasp the idea that thousands of Americans were murdered. And until people do, I think we're going to remain in the dark. Davian, again, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Folks, there's more to come straight ahead. We uh, get ready for Open Phone America. Your calls and more. Don't move a muscle. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And again, I just want to read you a line from uh, the infamous letter here uh, from, uh, what's his name? Osama bin Laden. Here's a quote. The president was not able to defend you against the security and economic loss. The way for change and freeing yourselves from the pressure of lobbyists is not through the Republican or Democrat parties, but through undertaking a great revolution for freedom. Do you really think Osama bin Laden is talking about freedom? Not to free Iraq from Saddam Hussein, but to free the White House and to free Barack Hussein so he can implement the change you seek. It does not only include improvement of your life, your economic situation, and ensure your security, but more importantly, helps him in making a rational decision to save humanity from the harmful greenhouse gases that threaten its destiny. Listen, you've got to be a special kind of stupid to think that Osama bin Laden wrote this letter. I'm just saying, you think that Osama bin Laden cares about harmful greenhouse gases (laughs) that threaten our destiny? And that we had to get rid of um, Bush so that we can have Barack Hussein so he can implement the change we seek. This campaign endorsement, I mean, it it almost reads like parody, this letter. So uh, to that, I say, I think this whole thing is a fake, phony fraud. We dig dig a little more. We'll see more. Uh, Anybody who's sympathizing with Osama bin Laden or the uh, alleged uh, letter that's purported to be from Osama bin Laden, uh, you, you you know, you probably hit your head one, two, three many times because this whole thing is ridiculous. And it, it seems like a page out of the CIA's playbook or a page out of any left wing Democrat. Anyway, folks, Open Phone America is coming up right now. Get your calls in 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. Taking your calls on all the topics we've discussed, whether it was China, whether it's the, the war in Gaza or the uh, stuff we discussed coming out of Congress earlier. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez, and we're coming right back. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez 
America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of the program, hour number three. We call it Open Phone America, and I'm happy to be here with you. I'm looking forward to speaking with you on all of the topics we've discussed tonight, whether it be the um, what happened in Congress, the ghost bus with the FBI uh, informants on it, at January 6th, out of yesterday's congressional hearing, uh, as well as the continuing resolution, what's going on with China, what's going on in Gaza, and everything else that's happening. We also discussed uh, Congressman George Santos not running for re-election after the results of a a very damning ethics uh, report came out from the House uh, Ethics uh, Committee, and or office, rather. And... uh, that's pretty much everything that I mentioned. Uh, there's also some news that the Pentagon has failed its sixth audit in a row. Yep. Sixth audit in a row. And uh, IBM has pulled their ads from Twitter c- citing hate speech on the platform. Um, in effect, really, this is an attack on Elon Musk saying that he's a Nazi. He, l- he allows Nazis. Listen, Elon Musk bought Twitter as is, and they've always allowed all sorts of crazy stuff on there. Uh, one day, <clears throat> funny story, I was looking for somebody. I wish I could remember their name. Uh, oh, I, I remember their name. Uh, it was, I was posting a tweet that legendary entertainer and singer Tony Orlando was joining us on this program. And I was searching for his handle on Twitter. And it just so happens to be that there is a, for lack of a better word, an adult film star, a porn star that goes by Tony Orlando as well. And he has a different, uh, I think he's like at Tony Orlando and, and the real Tony Orlando is at official Tony Orlando or Tony Orlando official. And I put it in and I clicked on the page and wow, to my surprise, there's a ton of triple X rated video content on Twitter. And, uh, and I was like, man, that stinks that it's, You know, if you don't know the right handle for Tony Orlando, that's what you get. But uh, it was just shocking to me. And there's no um, there's no filter for that. Twitter's made it clear as long as they're not raping people or doing it to underage people, you can put as much uh, of uh, triple X rated content as you want on Twitter. So it's always been this kind of platform. I think Musk has made it more free, not less free. And this seems to me like a swipe on him. Uh, from his own critics, uh, not something that's genuine, in my opinion. Uh, but that's uh, the big story on Twitter and the ads that IBM has pulled. So be that as it may, we are going to continue with your calls. And uh, I'd like to go to Doc in Wilmington, Delaware, W-D-E-L. Go right ahead. Rich, I need, I need to know your brother's name on a personal level. So I'm keeping my prayers Robert, every day. Robert Valdez, thank you for that. Matter of fact, the okay, wake was today. I just left the funeral home. Uh, it was like an hour or two to get home and then did some show prep and jumped right on the air. And um, that was uh, how that went down today. So thank you for that, Doc. I appreciate it. United States Marine I'll Corps, Robert Valdez. I also want to thank you. I missed it last week because I've been very ill with a head cold or something. I don't know what it is, a virus. I missed your good tribute to Jim. I want you to announce it in, in the, in, from, from now on in future so we don't miss it. I want to hear your tribute every year to Jim and Kathy Johnson. You've done that. I appreciate it, sir. I want to get to a topic. I want, uh, I want to take, get, get, get to two topics. One involves 9-11 and one involves Hamas. I want to take a leaf out of Jimmy's book, if I may, for two or three minutes here on the, on the air. Yeah, go right for, ahead. For a professor, there's a retired professor at our University of Delaware here who is a Soviet expert. He, he's worked for the CIA, okay? He told me in an aside— unequivocally, that the Russians under Putin had a hand in 9-11 as payback for the fact that we kicked him out of Afghanistan. Here's the, here's the key player. His name is Ahmed Shah Massoud, the Lion of the Panjir. He was, he was a freedom fighter against the Russians, and he was also a freedom fighter against the Talibs. He was assassinated right before 
he was a key key asset of ours in, in uh, uh, Afghanistan who warned CIA that that somebody who liked the Talibs would use airplanes against America. He didn't have any more than that. He said, "Watch for an airplane attack." He was assassinated right before 9/11, and uh, by by a guy wearing a, a, a explosive vest. My sources, who is still alive, said that that could be linked right, linked right back to the Russians. We've covered it up because we don't want war with Russia. I'm going to take a leaf out of Jimmy's book, who I admire, I admire very much. Yeah. It's fact that the PLO was aided by the Soviet Union during the Cold War, terrorists. I think right now, in my gut, that the Russians are not directly, but they're aiding av- avidly Hezbollah and Hamas and everybody and, and Islamic Jihad in the Middle East to take take care of Israel as because they're an American ally. I can't prove this, but I think Jimmy's right. I, I believe it in my gut. Your I don't there. doubt it at all. I don't doubt it at all because you know what? I was given these um, these communist sensing goggles, <laughs> and I I can't help but see connections amongst people that share similar philosophy, and these guys share it. They really do. Um, you know whether they're of uh, out and out communists. Or, you know, they're half and half, you know, half jihadist. But again, in, even in the letter from bin Laden, if it's really from bin Laden, the, the stuff he's talking about is the same stuff that you heard Castro talk about, that you've heard every last commie talk about. The, the oppressed and how we have to go after the evil colonizers, the imperialist Americans, yada, yada, yada. I've heard this a million times. And when you start hearing it, <clears throat> you would be able, in my opinion, you can tell when they're lying, right? These people aren't lying. They believe that to be true. They really do believe their own rhetoric. And and, and that's why I, I, I'm not surprised in the least because that's how the communist works. They're there to gossip and create problems and stir strife and create division and spark a war if they can because this is what they do to continue to do what they do. And it, I find it fascinating that it's always the people at the top that always make out, right? Whether we call them uh, Hugo Chavez in in Venezuela before his passing, whether they're called uh, the the mullahs, whether they're called whatever, these authoritarian types uh, all operate the same way, and they all every now and again will steal a page from the commie playbook. And when I see that happening, I can't help but notice. And I say to myself, these are not the good guys, not in the least. So I think you're probably right. I think there's always some sort of unholy alliance here, there, and everywhere else. All you got to do is watch people's actions, and I think they're always pretty um, revelatory. At least that's my take, Doc. I agree, and I want to thank you so much for letting me call in and and, and uh, spill my guts on your show and for having a great show. You're the best guy in America right now, and you, you are, you are, sir. The worthy heir to Jim Bohanna. You really are. Well, God bless you, brother. I hope you feel better, and I appreciate your kind words. You're very kind. And uh, we will come back with the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833 833- for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Well, Mr. Valdez, you have one of the greatest shows that radio has ever had. America at Night with Rich Valdez. So, again, we're looking at this letter um, uh, purportedly written by Osama bin Laden. And he presents a question. As for the first question, we are fighting and opposing you. The answer is very simple. One because you attacked us and continue to attack us. 1A, you attacked us in Palestine. 1A, I, (laughs) Roman numeral I, Palestine, which has sunk under military occupation for more than 80 years, 
the British handed over Palestine with your help and support to the Jews who have occupied it for more than 50 years. Overflowing with oppression, tyranny, crimes, killing, expulsion, destruction, and devastation, the creation and continuation of Israel is one of the greatest crimes, and you are the leaders of its criminals. And of course, there is no need to explain and prove the degree of American support for Israel. The creation of Israel is a crime which must be erased, says bin Laden. Each and every person whose hands have become polluted in the contribution towards this crime must pay its price and pay for it heavily. Now, <clears throat> whack job, right? I mean, the fact that you create a Jewish state is a crime. Uh, the other side of that argument is, no, it's not the fact that they created the Jewish state rich. Don't be so thick. Oh, then what's the reason? Oh, I'll tell you the reason. It's because you stole land from the indigenous people. But is it interesting? Uh, I find it interesting that the Jews didn't always have control over that area. At one point, uh, the Jordanians had influence there, and at some other points, the Egyptians had it. And it wasn't an occupation, quote-unquote, wasn't called an occupation until recently, until Israel was involved, and then they gave them back the land. And Hamas has done nothing right in Gaza. What have they done? Have they turned on electricity? Have they added power? Do people live uh, in, in conditions that are not squalor? Nope. So then what's the deal? What is it that uh, Hamas is doing for their people? <clears throat> anyway, this letter has been cited and cited and cited all over TikTok. And we mentioned it last night because it was blowing up. TikTok's now um, enforcing bans on content related to this, which, again, I think let it go. Free speech is free speech. Let people say things they want to say. If it's stupid, people won't listen and they won't come back. And, and that's, you know, how the free market works. But we have a clip of audio of somebody who's so impacted by reading this letter that they had to go to TikTok and make a video. Listen to this. So I just read a letter to America. And I will never look at life the same. I will never look at this country the same. I will never... I please read it and if you have read it let me know if you are also going through an existential crisis in this very moment because in the last 20 minutes my entire viewpoint on the entire life i have believed and i have lived has changed so you know what's fascinating here is this woman reads one letter and all of a sudden her worldview has changed she hates america everything is is uh upside down for her and look i don't mean to make light of it but come on really come on there's lots of things in life that we can become dismayed about uh bin laden today in 2023 probably is not one of them but i want to get your thoughts and opinions on this let's go to al myrtle beach south carolina you've got an interesting theory here uh let's go to wrnn al go right ahead thanks rich I don't believe that Bin Laden's actually gone yet. Why? Well, years ago, just before, uh, a couple months just before they said they, they got him, Obama had people from uh, Hollywood in, in the, into the old White House, and there's film on this. He's probably talking to them about um, setting this up. Okay, you, you, saw, you, you know the movie Die Hard, right? Sure. The scene, where, the scene just before Hans goes out the window, he explains, if you kill, if you buy, if you steal $600, million, $600, $600 they're not going to find you. If you say $600 million, they will find you unless they think you're dead. That's pretty much the same premise of what's going on now. All, all this nut, nutty crap going on, plus this letter thing, it's a setup. He's just sitting someplace in a cave waiting for, to, for the other shoe to drop. And the same thing with his, his sec, the second guy, with Zawahiri. They yeah. said they nailed him with a missile, but they didn't find any body parts. They covered that one up real, real quick, real cheap. Yeah, listen, I, I don't, I don't um, put it past our, our intelligence establishment to do something like that. <clears throat> I just 
don't have any reason to believe that that's the case. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be the case. I just, I, I don't see it personally. Um, I think there's a lot of bad guys. I think there's a lot of people that love a good uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, I know my, my brother, I have a brother that loves them. He absolutely loves them. I mean, in, in, if you talk to him for 20 minutes, you'll walk away with so many interesting ideas like um, the current president isn't the current president. Trump's still really the president. Now, I understand people say that, hey, look, Trump's the real president because he was robbed. I get that. That's fine if you want to say that. I don't believe that Trump is secretly running the country from Mar-a-Lago and Joe Biden's just uh, some android wearing a mask uh, or some old man that's an actor. Uh, Again, that may be true, but I'm going to need the proof in order to see it. And I don't mean some video that is kind of grainy, right? That could have been made with AI. But I mean, I, I want to see the real deal. I want to know what's going on. So I don't know. I don't know if that's actually a thing or not, but um, I'm going to lean on probably not the case because if he were alive, he'd likely want to take credit for a lot of attacks that have occurred since. And I don't think that that's happened. Anyway, Al, thank you for your call. I appreciate it. Big shout out to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, WRNN. And we will continue with the calls. Let's go to uh, Paul, Boise, Idaho. Go right ahead. Thanks for taking my call, Rich. Yes, sir. It sounds to me uh, uh, what I'm hearing is classic KGB disinformation um, composed by the KGB and maybe even disseminated and put together and passed out by the Chinese. Um, don't think that they're our friends just because we do a lot of business with them. They're not. They want total world domination. Um, mm-hmm. Global hegemony. I, I, you know, you know they, they, they shot bin Laden to death in a nice little place where he was living. And they, they took DNA and they used his son to find out whether or not it was him or not that had been killed. And I'm pretty convinced, you know, that the SEAL team guy that did that did it and it's, it's done. Um, you know, the, the one conspiracy thing that, that is not really a conspiracy, if you think about it, was after we lost, or after after the CIA helped the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which bin Laden was part of, I think that what happened after that was we paid him back after, after we got him out of there. Um, it came down to Poland and a new Polish Pope and Lech Walesa and Ronald Reagan hmm. and a huge influx, huge influx of Catholics who love their country in Poland. And that's where communism fell. Yeah. I, I, listen, good, good lesson in history. And uh, I agree. I've talked to some folks in Poland uh, and they're some of the best anti-communists out there. They could smell that stuff coming miles away. And I think that's uh, we all need that, right? You need the communist viewing goggles and a nose for commies to, to kind of steer clear. Paul, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Big shout out to KBOI. Folks are coming right back. I'm Rich Valdez. In live late night radio, six years in a row. It's Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 4Valdez. That's 833 482 5337. 833 4Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. I need you to stop what you're doing and go read A Letter to America. It is literally the craziest thing I've read in a while. And while I can't say that I'm that surprised, I am pretty shocked. So go read it and tell me what you think, because I really also need to talk to other people about this. And actually, before you even read the letter, I did want to mention in reading the letter, I could only think of this tweet that I saw the other day. 
Under settler colonialism, any kind of resistance is branded as terrorist because the only acceptable violence is violence by the occupier. Well, there you go. Another genius using uh, the, the, the key words, colonialist, occupiers, uh, imperialist. And they'll say that I say terrorism is OK. I'm not terrorizing anybody. And in this situation in Gaza, um, were the Israelis terrorizing anybody? Now, I'm sure people will take exceptions to that and say, sure, they are. They weren't letting them work. They weren't giving them water. They weren't giving them electricity. Stop. Stop with that crazy. Really stop. If you're voting for Hamas and Hamas is your political party for life, right, for the last 18 years or whatever the number is, and they don't get you electricity, they don't do anything, and they don't let you work, and they don't build an economy, and they get all these billions of dollars in aid, and nothing happens. I've seen video, and again, it could be fake, but the video I saw was what happens to all of the the water pipes that they've helped to improve irrigation in in uh, and plumbing in uh, Gaza. Well, the video I saw sh- showed that they were taking them out of the ground, digging them up, filling them with explosives and using them as rockets, the actual pipes. Now, again, um, I don't see that stuff happening anywhere else. So when you you sit here and tell me, oh, Hamas is fantastic. They do all these wonderful things. It's the Israelis that are the bad guys. Come on. I'm just just not buying it. Uh, I'm not saying they're saints. I'm just saying I'm not buying it. When you go and you slit the throats of little babies because what, you've had enough? Oh, I've had enough. I can't stand you. I'm going to go cut your baby's throat. I'm going to set your people on fire. I mean, re- who does that? I mean, it's absolute barbarism. Yes, I know it happened and it happens in wars and whatnot. Uh, but my point is, this is their first line of defense. Not a few bad apples amongst them that are psychos. Seems like they're all psychos. Anyway, we go back to your calls. We're talking about China, Biden, and everything else going on. Let's go to Tampa, Florida, WWTK and switch gears a little bit. And check in with Edward. Edward, you're on with Rich Valdez. Go right ahead. Yeah, Rich, thank you very much. Great to talk to you again. Uh, I wanted to bring yes, this sir. in to focus here. Uh, the uh, thefts that are happening now with Amazon and FedEx trucks. And also, we have seen illegals being caught shoplifting. Uh, some of these major cities like Chicago had a very beautiful, uh, brutal killing of a flight attendant uh, being hit with a Starbucks log. Can you believe that? Wow. So we need to, yeah. What needs to happen is we need to profile because uh, we know who who's committing these crimes. And also there needs to be a curfew. Once darkness falls upon a big city like New York, uh, L.A., Chicago, everybody needs to be off the street. Some of these police departments are letting people loiter when bars are closed. So there's a lot of this stuff that needs to be, I don't know, Department of Justice needs to move in on this. And, you know, and also we have a problem also with DAs that don't want to prosecute these people and put them, uh, put them away in jail. So I'm hoping the new administration is going to be able to tackle these issues. Let me tell you something, Edward. I, I was at... Um my brother's wake earlier today. My brother was a Marine. My other brother is retired NYPD. My other brother's retired NYPD and then went to work with the feds. So the, the room was filled with cops and feds and in conversation with people, you know, as I would leave the viewing room and take a break, I I was talking to this cop. He's been on the job 16 years, NYPD for the sake of the story. Uh, kind of looked like a black version of me, right? About my height, about my build, maybe a little stockier, uh, bald head, beard. And and he was telling me, he says, so check this out. The other day, I um, I respond to a call and a, a couple, two people, a woman and a guy, were robbed by some kid. This guy gets there, the officer. He, um, you know, he's like, what's going on? And he's like, these people said they took your stuff. He's like, do you have it on? The guy was like, no, nah, because you don't understand. It was, a, it was a confusion, blah, blah, blah. And he gives them back their stuff. Cop says, you want to press charges? And they go, no, we just want our stuff and we're out of here. So the cop now gives this guy a talking to, younger guy. 
And he's like, you can't go around robbing people. You know, that if I catch you around here robbing people again, I'm going to have to lock you up. Blah, blah, blah. And right at that very moment, uh, he tells me that an African-American woman approaches him and starts jamming a camera in his face, saying, uh, why are you talking to this young man who I think was also African-American? And I think the, the victims were also African-American. I think everybody involved here. Just, again, for the sake of context. Not that race matters. But I'm trying to tell you a story so you can visualize it. And so he's now telling this kid, giving her a stern talking to, this woman's jamming the camera in his face, and he's, he's on camera, so he can't just stop and, you know, it's against their protocol to sit there and explain why he's doing his job. But she's like, what did he do? What did he do? Why are you doing this to him? Why are you blah, blah, blah? So he finishes his lecture to the kid and tells him to, to get out of there. And then he tells the lady, he's like, you know, lady, you want to videotape somebody? Come videotape these people that are standing around the corner waiting for me to give them a copy of a report because they were just robbed. And the lady went to talk to him, and she wouldn't video them. And, uh, but she did, she did talk to them. And he finished the story telling me, he said, look, you know, the reality is, and I explained to everybody, the victims and the woman that was making the video, all I have the power to do is put handcuffs on somebody, bring them to a police uh, station, and give them a copy of the report and, and what they call a desk appearance ticket to show up in court. But we can't hold them because of the no cash bail law and because of uh, D.A. Alvin Bragg and his colleagues in the other boroughs that refuse to prosecute these types of crimes. And he says, you know, uh, I'm glad this happened at the tail end of my career. He's like, I'm, I'm done in a few more years. Or I think he's on a 25-year contract and he's been there for 21 years. Wh whatever the case was, I know he only had four years left. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, God bless this guy for doing what he does. It's a very difficult job. And what a shame, right, that in the, in the commission of doing the right thing and giving a warning to a, a young man that clearly should go to jail for robbing this couple, he gets a hard time from passersby. And all because we don't have prosecutors with any backbone. And that's, again, putting it mildly. I should say, we have prosecutors that have enough backbone to say we're not going to prosecute crime. We're going to be pro-crime, progressive prosecutors that coddle criminals. That is a huge problem. And it's exactly what you're describing with, with uh, the Amazon, the FedEx, and everything else that you described, Edward. This is insanity. When we normalize crime, when we legalize crime, this is a problem. And I don't see how we get out of it but for people rising up and saying enough is enough. We refuse to live in fear. We're voting this person out. We're going to use the political pressure uh, of we the people to push them out. And sadly, that hasn't happened. Anytime we see a, a mass assemblage, it's not we the people protesting that we should have more police. It's the bad guys, right? It's, it's them with their faces covered uh, talking about oppression and this and that and the third. Things that are all, in my opinion, not very productive for society. And until we get to that point, we're screwed. Edward, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Big shout out to everybody in Tampa, Florida, WWTK. And we're coming back to your calls and more. We got calls from Oregon, calls from Pennsylvania and more. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night. With Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Valdez with an S. 
All right, America, welcome back. And we continue with your calls uh, straight across America. I want to go now to the West Coast, Pendleton, Oregon, KUMA, and check in with our buddy Michael. Go right ahead. Hey, hey, Rich. Uh, Good talking to you again. Um, Hey, great shows this week. Uh, Thank you. Right at the beginning, I I wanted to send my condolences to your brother, Robert, uh, uh, who's in the military. Also, to thank him for his service. Uh, For your brothers who are in the police, I support the police very much. My brother has been a corrections officer here in Oregon for 40 years. Um, And so I support the brave men and women um, in the police and the armed forces. So I say that up front. Uh, thank and, you. I um, appreciate I that. It means them. a lot. Uh, you bet. You bet, Rich. Uh, yeah, I just had a couple things because um, <clears throat> I know you have other calls, too, to get to. <clears throat> um, I wanted to thank you for the great guests you've had who have their own great shows, too. Uh, uh, Joe Paggs. Oh, and, Joe Paggs uh, is classic. Jimmy, he's terrific. He's he, He's great. I listen to him and Jimmy Fela. Uh, you've had him, and he's oh, yeah. great. He's um, hysterical. Uh, what a what a great guy. Um, and you know, the other point was, of course, President Biden met with President Xi. My hope is that some good will come of that, Rich. And uh, I'm hoping that they mentioned something about maybe like a hotline where we could communicate. My hope for that is if that if there really is like a hotline like that established. That will help prevent some misunderstandings or some conflicts with China in the future. At least that's my hope. Well, Michael, I think your intentions are, are well intentioned and um, and kind. Um, we can't trust China. Trust me. If if Biden wants to get on the phone with Xi, he can get on the phone with Xi. He's literally. It doesn't matter if you became president of the United States. If I did, anybody who's in that oval can get in touch with whoever they want to get in touch with because ultimately you have the your finger on the button you've got you're the president of the United States there's a lot of power that comes with that role and this is the power that Biden abdicates and he he does nothing to advance the cause of America and this is why I'm I'm so disappointed in him it's not a partisan thing for me although it's true I typically don't like democrat policies uh, so therefore, Democrat politicians are never my fancy, if you will. But uh, Biden is a sellout. He's a sellout to this country and it, he's a disgrace to that office. He should be removed. He should quit. He should move on. But we shouldn't have him. He can get in touch with she anytime he wants to. And he doesn't. He puts on this dog and pony show to to appease them, to give them leverage. But that's doing nothing for us, and it's because he's afraid. He's a wuss, and he's a pacifist. Now, you can be a pacifist, but you have to have a backbone. Donald Trump is a pacifist, right? Donald Trump didn't start any wars. He's not a war guy. He doesn't care to feed the war machine, although he does because he understands how important it is to keep that balance. So he builds up the military, buys the bombs, buys the planes, renames, um, I didn't rename, he created uh, the Space Force, and all great things, in my opinion. However, Biden hasn't done anything like that. And I think Biden has a direct line of connection to Xi anytime he needs him. But he never he never does the tough talk. Even when he's trying to do the tough talk, he doesn't sound tough. Like when he says, well, yeah, yeah, she is a dictator. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have a difference of opinion. Or, you know, I'll never forget, you know, probably might be one of the most disappointing moments. Besides when he told uh, Charlemagne the God on the hip hop radio station in New York, um, uh, you don't know if you're voting for Trump or for me, then you ain't black. All right. I, I thought that was um, uh, his lowest moment, but it, it was really in a debate or a, a town hall, a candidate town hall when he was running for president in 2020, maybe might've been in 2019 or whenever I, he launched his campaign. And, and they, they asked him about China and he said, well, you know, it, it's cultural. They, they, they see things differently than, than we do. They do things differently there. And the question was about genocide and the Uyghur Muslims and, you know, should we call them out on their human rights abuses? And his response was, well, we're different. You know, what we consider a human rights abuse is commonplace for them. Sir, that doesn't work that way, right? Uh, you, you can't murder someone and then when the cop comes to lock you up, go, well, you know, it's a difference of opinion here. Obviously, it's a cultural thing. You know, where I come from, we kill people. And so, officer, you know, uh, you know maybe you don't kill people, but I kill people. So I'm good. No, it doesn't work that way. 
And and I think that was the moment I realized Biden's not just, you know, in foreign policy, uh, very incapable and incompetent. But moreover, it seemed like he was just really succumbing to pressure from China. He was afraid to call them a pariah state. He wasn't afraid to call the Saudis a pariah state, but he was afraid to label China that. And that, to me, is incredibly alarming and incredibly disappointing, not to mention puts America in a very difficult spot. So, Michael in Pendleton, Oregon, thank you, sir. Godspeed to you. I appreciate your kind words. And we come back to the rest of your calls and more. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Valdez. All right, it's the speed round, and we've got back to back Pauls on the line. We go to Paul in Zanesville, Ohio, W H I Z. Go right ahead. Good evening, Rich. Yeah, in a nutshell, I think Biden's in bed with China when it comes to that, but that's not what I called to talk about. What sure. I called to talk about was here in Ohio. We um, just um, uh, proved um, pro-choice when it comes to abortion, and we also um, voted to um, legalize the recreational use of marijuana. Now we have these Republicans who can't seem to uh, agree on anything saying no, say we don't want this, so we're going to try to put something in there, a bill or something that's going to try to stop it. What happened to a time when the voters said this is what we want and that's what it what it stood for? You know, I, I, I'm so sick of these these uh, the, our Congress, our government um, uh, saying, you know, when the people want this, they fight and they bicker back and forth, you know, about, no, you know, I don't care what you American people want. You see what I'm saying? We have voted for it. We put our word down for it. And now they're saying, no, we can't have this. You know, I, I'm just sick of, of, uh, of our politicians not listening to the American voters. And who knows how much, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, well, what do I want to say? Um, cheating's going on on there and everything, but right. I, I'm just tired of these. Yeah, yeah, you got me, Rich. You, you I got you. Listen, I hear you. Here's where I think the rub is, uh, if I understand this the right way. So if the people in the state of Ohio want to legalize a marijuana within the confines of Ohio, they can do that, and the state can do that. However, marijuana is still a Schedule One narcotic federally. And so if Congress is objecting to that, they're doing it at the federal level, irrespective of the fact that they're representing their district within a state, they're doing it at the federal level. So I think until there's consensus amongst uh, those in Congress in the Republican caucus or outside of the Republican caucus, um, they probably won't agree. And I don't know where I stand on that one. I, I, it's, it, I, I'm kind of out to lunch on that one. Paul, thank you for the call. Other Paul, Reading, Pennsylvania, W-E-E-U. We're down to less than a minute. Go for it, brother. Um, thank Rich. Uh, yes, sir. The Jews actually were in uh, the Holy Land from Abram and, and Isaac, and uh, so, so they're not interlopers, and, and that, that's an error. Secondly, in oh, we'll leave secondly for tomorrow, if you don't mind calling back in for that one, but I agree with you. Um, you know, Judea and Samaria. Judea is, you know, in Spanish, the word for Jew is Julio. Sounds a lot like Judea, right? So, I mean, I think this is their land. They got their place back with the uh, Balfour Accords. And here we are today. Folks, take care. Good night. And God bless America. I'm Rich Valdez. <laughs>